Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's special webinar. As you can see my face here, um, we also have a second face that you should be able to see, which is Michael Braun. Um, my name is Jenna and I work for Emerging Destinations. We represent the Guyana Tourism Authority in North America. Today, we have a really special presentation for you from Michael Braun, who is a research scientist at the Smithsonian Institution. So he's actually going to be taking us through some of his research. As you can see on the screen there, we're going to be getting in. He's going to go into a little bit into the science of it, ecotourism, and of course, endangered birds in Guyana and how ecotourism has actually helped with the conservation of that. So this is a special presentation and um, with the GTA, we've uh, collaborated with the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian Institution. So this will be a very fun and interesting one for you. Um, I'm not going to talk too much more besides that. I will give you a few housekeeping items to go uh, just to keep note of as we go throughout the presentation today. As always, this webinar will be recorded. So if you need to step away or answer a call, anything like that, do not worry. I will send the recording out to everybody later this week in our webinar follow up. Um, as well as we would love for you to participate. So on the GoToWebinar control panel throughout Michael's presentation, please feel free to write a comment or ask us a question. And we will have a Q&A with Michael at the end of that. So he will actually answer as many of those as we can live. So hopefully uh, you enjoyed the presentation on birding in Guyana today. That's all for me. I'm going to hand things over to Michael. Thank you very much, Jenna. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to talk a little bit about uh, first our research that uh, I and others from the Smithsonian Institution have been doing in Guyana and Northern South America for many years, but how that's led us to, uh, through, through ecotourism actually, to uh, some conservation efforts uh, involving birds and other organisms. Um, so let's go ahead and get into this. Um, so uh, the talk today I've tried to organize in, in three parts. Uh, first is a, just a very brief overview of Smithsonian scientific research in Guyana. And then uh, I'll talk about three birds that actually do need help, two that are endangered and others that may become endangered if, we're, if they're not managed appropriately. And then I'll just uh, touch on how ecotourism has, we've realized that ecotourism can really be a, a great help in accomplishing those uh, conservation goals. So actually connecting scientific research with, uh, with a sustainable environmental uh, action through um, the fun and excitement of ecotourism. So, uh, so just, uh, just uh, to begin with, I imagine many people uh, on the webinar are familiar with uh, Guyana, but for those that are not, uh, it's a it's a wonderful country with a diverse uh, set of habitats about uh, 500 to 600 miles north to south, two to 300 miles east to west, depending on where you are. Um, and this map shows a couple of things. It shows the diverse habitats. So that most of Guyana is dominated by lowland tropical forest. Uh, let's see. I hope you can be able to see my cursor here. Um, but uh, in the, in the southwest uh, of the country, there are large savannas. And along the western fringe, a series of mountain ranges that have different habitats. And then up on the, the coastal region of Guyana is where the vast majority of the human population is concentrated. So most of the interior of Guyana is pretty pristine as tropical countries or any countries go. And about 80% of the country is still in the natural land cover. Uh, before that it was in before uh, human uh, you know occupation. And the stars that are shown on this map are the various localities where we've carried out uh, ornithological field work where we've studied the birds in Guyana over the past uh, 25, 26 years now. So and so first, just an overview of some of the habitats. Uh, I mentioned that it's a really pristine country, which is one of the very special things for visitors uh, to be able to see uh, this untouched, you know, these untouched expanses of tropical forest. So here's a, a beautiful shot of the braided rivers, the Essequibo River, where it braids through all this tropical forest in the center of the country. These savannas that I mentioned in the Southwest, which are called the Rupa Nuni savannas in Guyana. Spectacular waterfalls in the mountains of the western part of the country. This is Kaitur Falls, and we'll come back to this later. 
and then high mountains. This is Mount Roraima, uh, otherwise known as the mother of waters. It's a triple point where the countries of Guyana, um, Venezuela, and Brazil all uh, meet at the top, uh, at the crest of this mountain. Uh, this is from the Guyana side, which is actually the most inaccessible part of the mountain. Um, but uh, I mentioned it's uh, also known as the mother of waters. Uh, three great rivers of South America all uh, all start from the top of this mountain. So it's uh, it it uh, it feeds the Orinoco drainage to the north, the Amazon drainage to the south, and the Essequibo drainage to the east uh, on the Guyana side. So and just to prove that I actually have been there, here's a picture of me some time ago at the foot of Mount Roraima. Uh, our uh, our, um, we have many uh, you know, friends and partners in Guyana, but our chief partner on the scientific work uh, that the Smithsonian has been doing through these years is the University of Guyana. And so here's the building, the Biodiversity Center that the Smithsonian actually helped fund uh, on the, the uh, Turkian campus of UG uh, in Georgetown. Well, uh, you know, what we're about here at the Smithsonian, one of the major things, at least in my museum, is uh, is biological diversity. And so that's what we were doing in Guyana, surveying the biological diversity of this really pristine country. So we get to see some spectacular organisms and crazy bizarre organisms like this giant anteater, the Jabiru stork, the tallest stork in the world, and some spectacularly beautiful birds like this Guyanan cock of the rock. Um, and the, the, uh, the products of that research uh, are, you know, uh, basically uh, two things. They're scientific publications, so to, to descriptions of the work that we've done and the things that we've learned, both in terms of the plants, the animals, the fish, uh, and the ecosystems of Guyana, um, but also uh, for the, so in, in this past 35 years of fieldwork now in Guyana by the Smithsonian and others has resulted in more than a thousand scientific publications about uh, the biodiversity of both Guyana and the Guyanan Shield region of Northern South America, uh, but also the scientific specimens that have been collected uh, and are preserved in major museums are a, a great treasure for the future. It's a, it's a cat snapshot in time of the biological diversity that's there. Uh, and in, in these uh, later years, as we do these expeditionary uh, surveys of biodiversity, one of the key things that we do is collect genetic samples because nowadays with uh, modern genetic technology, can we, we can learn so much more about the biodiversity uh, in the laboratory uh, at, an, at a whole other level. So, and all of this research supports uh, things like employment in Guyana, education, ecotourism, and sustainable use of the natural resources of the country. And so just here on the left is one example of the, of the scientific publications. It's a checklist of the birds of Guyana that we wrote uh, some years back. This, this edition is about 10 years old, and we need to update it now because it's uh, a lot, of, we've found more birds and, and some of the names have changed. So, whoops, let's see now, I need to go. Okay, so, uh, so now I'm gonna talk about three, uh, three birds uh, that, uh, that we learned uh, more about during this research uh, effort. Uh, and the first and most surprising of which was this little bird, the red siskin. So here's a male red siskin on the left, a female on the right. This is a bird that actually uh, was not known to occur in Guyana, so it was a big surprise when we found a population of these birds there. Um, and it was, uh, it was like uh, finding a new lease on life for an endangered species because this bird had become endangered uh, some years before in its previously known range, and people did not hold much hope for its survival in the wild. So I'm gonna tell you more about this bird now and, and where, we've, uh, where we've gotten in terms of thinking of uh, its preservation. So here's a map of Northern uh, South America showing the originally known range of the red siskin up here in pink across uh, Northern Venezuela, just getting over into Colombia. They used to occur in Trinidad, they're now extirpated there. And the, the, they're just fragmentary, tiny populations left in a few places across this large range. Uh, and the, the birds have disappeared largely, as I'll show you in a minute, because of the pet trade. 
And then down here in Guyana is the region where we discovered this new population. You can see it's a long way away. It's about 900 kilometers away from any place where the bird was previously known to occur. So, and then just a word on how the bird became endangered. It turns out that the red siskin has been in the international pet trade since the 1800s. They're worth about $500 to $1,000 a pair of, uh, of, of wild caught birds now. And the, what, what, um, what bird fanciers uh, the, want to do with these birds, nowadays they do raise red siskins for their own right. But back in the 1800s and through most of the 1900s, mostly what people did with these birds was that they would hybridize male red siskins with female canaries to produce these color bred canaries. And these birds you can still easily find on the website on the internet today. Uh, it's a, still a popular thing to do, but it's resulted over 150 years of intense trapping in the decimation of red siskin populations in the wild. So, and this is a remarkable story. There's actually been a book written about it. It's called A Brand New Bird. It's written by Tim Burkhead, and it describes how canary breeders actually set out to, with in the early part of the of the 1900s, set out to, to transfer the genes from the red siskin, the red factor genes, into the canaries to make red canaries. So, and this is the this is the whole, it's unsustainable use of this resource, of this natural resource, which has led to the decimation of the natural populations of red siskin in Venezuela. So Okay, but then in, it was the year 2000, we discovered this population in Guyana. And we, you know, we kept the popu this population secret for some time, but conservation efforts began immediately. It took three years actually to get the bird legal protection in Guyana since it wasn't known to occur in the country. It wasn't on their endangered species list yet. Um, but the bird, uh, we, we have the effort that I'll tell you a little bit more about has been successful in preventing red siskin trafficking out of Guyana uh, because of the efforts of local people in the Guyana, in Guyanese. Uh, and uh, the, the special thing about this population is it, it's kind of a, a lease on life for this species because it's in a safe place, a relatively uh, remote area where uh, the local people know about it and consider it part of their heritage. And so they don't want it trapped. They don't want it uh, shipped out. And Guyana is actually the only place in the world now where ecotourists can see this very rare bird in the wild. Uh, the areas in Venezuela and Colombia where it still occurs are uh, pretty much off limits because of the political unrest in those countries. So, uh, and crucial to this effort has been the establishment of, of what's known as the South Rupununi Conservation Society. It was a group of, of local guys, mostly young guys, Amerindian folks here that you see in this photograph, um, that were actually working for us uh, on the on the Smithsonian uh, field work in the area. But they immediately appreciated how special this bird was and that it was a special thing that was from their homeland. And so they set up a local uh, NGO, a non-governmental organization, to do to monitor, research, and protect the red siskin population in Guyana. And so we've worked them, with them through these now 20 years to, uh, to make sure that the bird, uh, the population there thrives. So, and over these years, uh, basically uh, a, a quite a, a large international consortium has grown up that we now call the Red Siskin Initiative. Uh, this, is just, this is just a fraction of the organizations that have helped us with this effort now uh, in Guyana, uh, in the United States, in Venezuela, and around the world. So, um, and actually, just to go on just a bit more, the goal for red siskins is now not just to preserve the Guyana population, but to recover the population in the rest of its uh, former range in Venezuela and Colombia, and maybe even Trinidad too. So, and the the strategy that we're taking on this turns out that red siskins in those areas. Uh, live and breed in coffee farms, but not not modern coffee farms, ones where that's it's mechanistic agriculture and monoculture of coffee, but the traditional way that coffee was grown, which is actually in shade coffee farms. So shade coffee farms are more like a forest, as you can see here. This is an actual shade coffee farm in Venezuela, uh, and shade coffee promotes biodiversity because it's a it's a real ecosystem. 
Uh, and we are partnering with shade coffee farmers, traditional farmers in Venezuela, to use their coffee farms as reintroduction sites for uh, red siskins in, the, in Venezuela. And the idea then is to promote sustainable agriculture where you have bird-friendly coffee, coffee and chocolate that's being grown in a more natural situation, a more diverse ecosystem, still producing a cash crop for the farmers, but also protecting the ecosystem and providing habitat for uh, the natural uh, biodiversity there. And I must say that this is a much more, I, the reason it's called sustainable agriculture is as opposed to sun coffee, which requires fertilizer, pesticides, fungicides, and you get a lot of soil uh, erosion, uh, shade coffee is a much more natural ecosystem that doesn't require all that intervention. So, uh, so there's, so, so, Bird-friendly coffee is one thing that you can buy and bird-friendly chocolate. We actually have a red Siskin chocolate bar made in Venezuela that helps support this whole effort. So, okay, on to the second uh, bird that I wanted to talk about today. And it's this very beautiful parakeet called the sun parakeet. And this bird uh, is native only to a very small area of Western Guyana in the Southern Pacaraima Mountains in northeastern or north central Brazil. So this is just an approximate range of the species. So a tiny range for this thing uh, in, its, in its original range. Um, this bird, it's, it's kind of a similar story. This bird came into the pet trade in the 1970s and 80s. It was trapped intensively in Guyana and Brazil. It actually disappeared completely from Guyana and was decimated in the wild in Brazil. And the wild population really has not recovered, even though it's not being trapped now and it's now it's, it's regulated in both countries, the wild population really has not yet recovered. It's only found in a very small area of Guyana uh, on the border with Brazil. Uh, but again, there are opportunities for the recovery of this bird because it breeds well in captivity. And it, you, this is a bird if, in the US, Canada, Western Europe, you may have seen this bird in a pet shop uh, it's very common in the pet trade. More than 20,000 of them are actually bred in the United States annually for the pet trade. And parrot lovers are willing to help recover this wild population. They'd like to do it be before it becomes endangered, officially listed as endangered, so that, uh, that, you know, that they can continue to enjoy the bird as a pet. Uh, but this bird is an absolutely star attraction for ecotourism because, as you can see, it's a spectacularly beautiful bird. They travel around in flocks. Uh, and I'll show you some more photographs here of them in a bit. So, uh, and again, ecotourism is central to this uh, opportunity because already the local area, the village where this bird occurs in Guyana still today, Karasabai, has recognized that this is an economic opportunity for them. So here's a picture of the sun parakeet on the village council house of Karasabai and on the tail of a of a commercial aircraft, Transguyana aircraft uh, in, in Guyana. So, so uh, the Guyanese are recognizing this ecotourism op opportunity. But there are also challenges because this bird has been hybridized extensively with other similar parakeets in captivity. And so if, if we ever did actually try to do a reintroduction effort for this bird, which we're not currently contemplating because the the wild population is stable and might be able to recover on its own. Um, but if we were to ever attempt a reintroduction effort with this bird, we'd have to screen these captive birds genetically because if they had any hybrid ancestry, we wouldn't want to reintroduce hybrid birds in the wild. We, want, we, we would want to reintroduce birds that are pure sun parakeets back in so that we wouldn't be contaminating the wild population with genes from other species of, of parrots. Uh, okay, and then the third example, just very quickly, this is a, something that's unique to Guyana in the Caribbean region. Uh, it's this, uh, these two singing finches, uh, which in English at the bottom there, you can see are called the chestnut-bellied seed finch and the large-billed seed finch. And in Guyana, these birds are referred to as the Tawa Tawa and the Tua Tua. And these birds are part of a, of a unique uh, sport that goes on. Uh, it's actually a gambling uh, kind of uh, sport that goes on in Guyana, Trinidad, and other regions of Northern South America and in the Caribbean. 
And so, and it's called bird racing. And so here you see a bird racing competition near the Harbor Bridge, the Demerara Bridge in Georgetown. Basically what goes on is on Saturdays and Sundays, it's mostly men, you can see here, men gather, they, they raise these birds, they keep them uh, and they train them to sing in competition with other birds. And so you can see there are two cages here side by side. And what's going on is a, is a competition to see which bird will sing the most, sing the loudest, sing the, and cause the other bird to stop singing. And so this is, uh, you know, and, and the, the men bet on it, it's a big sport. In, as I say, in Guyana, Trinidad, and other areas in this area. And this is, uh, you know, it's part of Guyanese culture. It not only exists in Guyana, uh, but here's a bird racing competition in New York City, in the United States, in Queens. Uh, there's an area of New York City where a lot of Guyanese uh, expatriates uh, live, and they brought this part of their culture with them. So here's a bird racing competition going on in New York. Um, well, of course, you know, this is great sport, but, and it's fine if it, uh, you know, if it doesn't damage the wild population, but unfortunately, uh, so far, pe the, the people that participate in the sport, they tend to prefer birds taken from the wild as opposed to birds bred in captivity. And so both of these species have been very heavily trapped. They have both disappeared completely from coastal Guyana. It's, it's same kind of thing has happened in Trinidad. Other species that are used in Trinidad have disappeared completely. And both of these birds are now quite scarce uh, in the Rupununi savanna where they, they still do occur. But again, here's a recovery opportunity because both of these birds could be bred in captivity for use in bird racing. And that would ease the pressure on the wild population and actually provide employment and a cash economy for uh, people that would be would take part in the bird breeding effort. Because these birds, again, a uh, champion uh, bird in the sport is worth hundreds of US dollars. So, uh, so there are uh, a lot of potential benefits for Guyana uh, of these uh, of of focusing on these endangered species, and among them are things like employment, ecotourism, education, and environmental sustainability. And here, just a montage. This is actually the original uh, officers of the South Rupununi Conservation uh, Society, the group that has done so much great work with the Red Siskins in the south of Guyana. Here's the uh, the canopy walkway at Ata Tower, a uh, great uh, ecotourism uh, asset of the country. And then along the lines of education and involving people, here is the Guyana uh, Amazon Tropical Bird Society on a bird walk in uh, in Georgetown that I took part with, took part in, and one of my former postdocs uh, uh, when we were traveling to Guyana with a group of of local uh, young people in. Uh, in Georgetown who are, you know, learning about and studying birds uh, right there in the, in the Botanic Garden in the capital. Okay, well then I'm just going to wrap up with uh, talking just quickly about uh, how ecotourism has uh, developed and how it has benefited and what, what the real attractions are uh, in, a, in a, a wonderful, a pristine country like Guyana that is, is so much uh, has so much more wild uh, areas than, than almost any other country. There are very few countries on earth that have, have so much of their uh, natural habitat still well preserved. Uh, and so the slides I'll show you are from a tour that I led uh, last year, last October and November. Uh, but uh, you know there are many ecotourism uh, companies that are now offering trips to Guyana and a, and a great uh, set of in-country partners that are offering the logistics and, uh, and guiding services and expertise to these things. So this, this trip was organized by Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, largely because Victor's an old friend of mine, uh, knew him growing up. Uh, and he's, he built one of, the, uh, one of the premier ecotourism companies in the world, but also Field Guides Incorporated uh, has trips there, another great uh, birding uh, ecotourism company, uh, Rock Jumper, and I'm sure many other uh, uh, companies that you may be familiar with. So again, these slides now are from one trip that we did uh, last October, but just to show you how it can bring uh, bring international travelers into uh, into contact and appreciation of Guyana. Uh, so here's our group uh, actually on that canopy walkway at Ata Rainforest Lodge in the center of Guyana. And here on the right, taking the picture of uh, the selfie is David Escanio, my co-leader uh, on the trip. 
and I mentioned David in particular uh, because uh, he is a he is a professional tour guide, international tour guide, uh, and David is actually the lead author of the newest book to the birds of Venezuela. And this is particularly relevant for Guyana because actually there isn't a field guide to the to the birds of Guyana, uh, and so David's book is the best uh, tool to to use when you're uh, when you're birding in Guyana when you're trying to when you're showing people the birds of Guyana. But actually, as a result of this collaboration, David and I are in conversation with a couple of publishers to go ahead and produce a field guide for the birds of Guyana, which will take a couple of years. But uh, but building off of his birds of Venezuela, we could uh, we could accomplish that uh, in a reasonable period of time. So uh, and so just to, here's a here's a set of guides that were involved. Here's Ron Alacock, who was our in-country uh, you know tour provider uh, organizer. Ron did all the logistics for this trip. Myself and David in the back, and three uh, young guys who are uh, local guides at Ata Rainforest Lodge in the Iwakrama Forest. Uh, these guys are, are local guys that grew up in Amerindian villages of Karasabai and Surama, right in this region. Uh, but they are great birders. They know the birds. They know the forest. They've got great ears and great eyes, and they really were great at showing people uh, birds. So. Okay, well, the trip started with a visit to Kaitur Falls, which is, you, you got to start or end every trip to Guyana at Kaitur because it's just one of the most spectacular sites uh, that you'll ever see. This is um, the tallest uh, continuously flowing free drop waterfall in the world at over 700 feet tall. There are taller waterfalls, but sometimes they go dry. So this is, it's, a whole river goes right over a cliff here, and it's a spectacular, thing to visit. Here's a double rainbow that we were able to catch there at Kaitur. Uh, and the gorge below the falls, you can just see the entire region is coated with this thick, lush tropical forest that's full of wildlife, full of birds that are disappearing in many other areas. Uh, and as I say, we're the, the local guys, this is John. I can't remember John's last name at this point, but that's, they don't, they don't worry with too much with last names in Guyana. John was, uh, grew up in one of the villages right there in the region, and he knew the birds really well. Here, here he is showing some of our tour participants an undergrowth uh, uh, ant bird. Uh, spectacular birds uh, that we got great looks at. And David, fortunately, David Escanio is a great photographer. So most of these bird photographs are from him. Here's the Toco Toucan, a bird that also is, uh, you know, heavily, uh, in, you know, impacted by the pet trade and has disappeared from many areas of Guyana, but we were able to get it on this, on this trip. Scarlet macaws, uh, the Nakunda nighthawk, a really special bird of the southern savannas in Guyana, giant uh, nocturnal bird. Now, traveling in Guyana, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not, um, you know, a walk in the park. <laughs> there are, uh, you know, there are not uh, any uh, paved roads in the interior of Guyana, so sometimes you do run into challenges. Uh, and it was a very rainy season while we were there, but of course our guides, our local guides, are always prepared for these things. So here's a mud hole that we got stuck in, but they got us out shortly. Uh, and of course there are other challenges. You know, sometimes the vehicles. Uh, you know, might run into a little bit of a, an issue with an engine starting, but these guys are, you know, they're, they're used to dealing with all this stuff and they come prepared. And you can see that Ron, he's an experienced tour guide. He right away, you know, invokes a little distraction. Oh, don't worry about the engine. Look at that bird up there. So, uh, so uh, but uh, all of this, you know, worked out fine. And people had a great time. We got to see a lot of great things. Here we actually ran across another uh, tour group at a, one special attraction. So we spent together with this other group, uh, you know, uh, more than about three hours at the at the Harpy Eagle Nest, hoping to see the eagle. Uh, we didn't actually eagle didn't come back in that time. We saw it at another uh, another nest later on. But everybody enjoyed meeting the the other group, meeting these other guides. Here's Leon Moore, another Guyanese. Uh, Who's now full-time uh, guide leader, making a making a career out of ecotourism. So, uh, and just to show you the just the the size of the forest, this is my brother David and myself uh, standing at the foot of the harpy eagle nest tree. Uh, so you get a sense of how enormous uh, some of these uh, 
forest giants really are. So, uh, and again, the birds, just a lot of unusual uh, organisms, uh, you know, some of the really special rare birds that are hard to find, hard to show people include these potus. Uh, Guyana has five species of potus. There are, only, there are only seven species of potus or eight rather in the entire world. It's a family of birds that's restricted to the neotropics in the forest. And these birds are incredibly cryptic, incredibly hard to find because they sit during the daytime in very well camouflaged positions. So this long-tailed potu on the left is sitting at the end of a stub. And you can see that this bird, if it closed its eyes and closed its mouth and stuck its bill in the air, which is actually a, a posture that they assume whenever they feel frightened, um, they, it just looked like the end of that stick, that stub there. And so they're very hard to find. They're active at night, uh, you know, and so during the daytime, they're really hard to find. The guy on the, on the right here, the Rufus Potu, is an even rarer bird that's in the forest interior. And this bird actually, if I were to play a video of this bird, it would actually be rocking back and forth uh, when we walk up to it and when it sees us. It, it doesn't try to fly away. It just starts rocking gently in the breeze. And it's believed that this bird is actually imitating uh, a dead leaf, um, a cluster of dead leaves hanging in the forest canopy there and swaying in the breeze because it, they, don't, they don't fly away, <laughs> but they're very hard to find. And, uh, uh, but our, our guides uh, had one located, Ron, had they been staked this bird out and knew where to find it. And it perches on the same branch every day. And so they were able to take our whole group there and show them this very rare bird. Well, again, we had great success on this trip. We did find the sun parakeets, got to see those in the wild. Here's a photograph taken by David on this trip. And red siskins, again, we had to spend two days looking for the red siskins, but we found them in the wild as well. Uh, so it was a very successful trip. I think all, everybody enjoyed it. And we were uh, slated to do it again in October 2020. Right now, of course, travel is going to be hard. So we expect to do it uh, to offer the trip again in October of 2021. Uh, and but we didn't let people loose without actually trying to do a little bit of uh, of uh, I don't want to call it politicking, but uh, uh, but uh, you know thinking about the future of Guyana and thinking about uh, environmental uh, you know conservation. And so this is uh, the, uh, uh, a little dinner that we hosted at the end of the trip uh, with all of our group, uh, all the guides and some family here, but also important members of the community in Georgetown. So this is Sidney Alacock, the uh, Minister of, uh, of Amerindian Affairs for the country and one of the vice presidents of the country. Uh, this is Carol Ann Marcus. She works at, as, in ecotourism at Iwak Rama or did, she's recently left there. Uh, and then over here, Calvin Bernard, who uh, is the Dean of, uh, of, um, of Sciences at the University of Guyana, and Priya Maharaj, who is the Director of the Biodiversity Center now at the University of Guyana. So we had a, uh, uh, a last uh, night banquet with all of these folks and talked about our experiences, heard from Minister Alacock about the future of the country and about the challenges, but also the opportunities uh, that Guyana is uh, seeing looking forward. So, okay, well, that's a, a quick trip through uh, science, ecotourism, and uh, economic and environmental opportunity in Guyana. I'd just like to recognize all of the many organizations and uh, individual, many individuals in, in each of these organizations that have contributed to the Red Siskin Initiative and in our efforts to recover that bird. Uh, there's much more to be done, uh, but uh, but I'll, um, I'll uh, stop now and uh, see if anyone, I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing with us some of that knowledge that you have about birding in Guyana. That is really, really special. So thank you for that. As Michael just mentioned, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type those through now. Uh, we do have a few for you already lined up here, Michael, so I'll get started with that. Um, the tour that you had just discussed, that you had just been uh, mentioning, uh, how long were you on that tour for that you were able to see all those different birds? So what would you kind of recommend as an average time to go actually give yourself enough opportunity to see some of those birds that you mentioned? 
Uh, yeah, that, there's a lot of um, things that go into planning a trip. Um, that that tr the all of the the trip was actually organized in two parts, so a main tour and then an extension to it. Uh, and so that the full length of that was I think 16 days. Um, but we try to organize it to fit into people's to traveler schedules. So the main trip was organized around a, a nine day uh, you know uh, week with the weekends, uh, and then. Uh, and the the extension uh, took on the next week after that. Um, so, uh, you know, we saw a lot of birds in that time. You can get a good taste of the country, but there's still a lot more to see. So uh, I think the, the right way to look at it is, uh, you know, uh, nine to, to, to 15 days, 16 days is a good start. And that will give uh, people uh, plenty of uh, taste of the country and, uh, and a reason to come back, visit again. Wonderful. And so I have a question for you, Michael. How did you get into birding? Uh, well, I, I've just always been interested in nature. I grew up in Texas, uh, so I was interested in butterflies and, and snakes and turtles and frogs, anything I'd get my hands on as a kid in Texas. Uh, but I, I, I spent uh, so, several summers uh, working at a Boy Scout camp uh, when I was you know, in my teens, uh, junior high and high school in Central Texas. And uh, one of my good friends there that was also working as a nature counselor, I was into the snakes and turtles and he was interested in birds. And so we started going out to, you know, together into the woods and uh, he'd show me, show me the birds and I'd show him the snakes. Well, it turns out that birds are a lot easier to find than snakes. So. <laughs> So I ended up uh, spending most of my career working on birds. That is great. Um, just just a quick note for everybody. We will make sure to send out the recording um, to this entire presentation. So if you do need to step out now, we will make sure to send that out to you in our webinar follow up. So don't worry about that. You will all definitely get a link to this recording. Um, another question here for you, Michael. Um, is the pet trade coming under more regulation? And that's both in Guyana and, oh, sorry, in Guyana. Uh, in Guyana, Guyana is, uh, is still has a, an active um, wildlife export uh, trade and industry, uh, which a lot, of, a lot of countries have severely uh, curtailed and regulated. Um, it's, um, and, you know, there's a lot of, argument in both ways. Um, my personal view of it is that it's, um, you know, that what, what's important is not whether you're extracting wildlife, but whether you're doing it in a sustainable, uh, conscientious fashion so that the natural ecosystems are preserved. And if you are going to uh, export wildlife, then you do it in a way, you, you, it's regulated, it's managed, there are quotas, and you're monitoring the situation. Just to use one example, the, the among the most highly prized, uh, you know, wildlife uh, export items are the macaws, the large parrots, long-tailed parrots, like the scarlet macaw that I showed earlier. Um, these birds have absolutely disappeared from much of their range throughout the neotropics because of, of, of the pet trade, trapping for the pet trade, as well as habitat destruction, but primarily more so because of the pet trade. Uh, but these birds are still quite common in Guyana. All of the big macaws are there and you know and they're there in numbers. So 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 far at least the, the pet trade has not had an impact on most species in Guyana. However, the sun parakeet is a, a counterexample because the sun parakeet, it's a small bird, uh, but it only occurs in a very small area. And so when it came into the pet trade, in the 1970s and 1980s, people, I don't think people in Guyana or the international uh, you know, uh, market uh, marketers were really aware of how small uh, its range was, how vulnerable that population was. And so it was heavily trapped and, uh, and the population was decimated in a few years. Fortunately, in that case, the birds breed very well in captivity. And so now there's not near as much pressure to trap the birds in the wild. And there is the opportunity, at least, for them to recover in the wild. So it's a question 
of managing the pet trade. Again, people in, in, in the environmental law, uh, movement are all over the map, conservation movement. Some people would like to completely eliminate the pet trade, but my personal view of it is that, uh, you know, I, I, when I was a small child, I was fascinated with the pets that I had. I had many pets and, uh, and that's one of the ways that I related to the natural world. So I think it, pets do help to, uh, to interest people in nature. Uh, and so I think there's a great value there to pets and zoos. And if we, if we find the common ground of, so that we can appreciate nature and all of the various forms and value, uh, I think that's the that's the the right way to think about it for the future. Great, thank you for that. Um, a question about the Guyana cock of the rock. Um, is that is it currently endangered? And second part to that question: Is it found only in Guyana, or is that different from the cock of the rock found in Peru, for example? It is a different species from the one found in Peru. The one in Peru is called the Andean cock of the rock. So it occurs in the Andes from Venezuela down through to Bolivia. Uh, the one in Guyana is called the Guianan cock of the rock. It's not only in Guyana, it also it occurs across the lowlands of the Guianan shield region. So that's uh, in easternmost Venezuela, most of lowland Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, and uh, French Guiana and also northern Brazil. But that's a very coherent, uh, uh, ecologically speaking or biodiversity speaking, that Guiana and Shield region is an area of high endemism. So there are five countries involved, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a very coherent biological region. And the Guiana and Cock of the Rock is endemic to that bio biome. All right. So in your opinion, what's the best time of year to bird watch in Guyana? Ah, uh, well, the, the, there's uh, there's a couple of answers to that question <laughs> um, <laughs> because you're balancing various things. But uh, but basically the best time uh, for birders specifically is March, April, uh, because that is a time when most birds in the forest are in their 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 breeding seasons are starting to uh, starting. They're really getting into the breeding season, which occurs before the rainy season. Which uh, the rains will begin typically in May, uh, you know, and be heavy rains in May and June. Uh, so that's the best time to go in terms of seeing the most uh, most bird diversity. Uh, the challenge always is though is that the rains are a bit unpredictable, and so if the rains start early. You can kind of, you know, you can get wet uh, and get get stuck sometimes. I, we were once stuck on the wrong side of a river for uh, three or four days when it rain rain came up. There was no bridge and we had to wait until the till the water went down uh, before we could cross over the ford at that river. Um, but uh, th we did we did this trip uh, and we're offering this trip again uh, to see these these uh, rare birds in October, November. The reason why we do it then is because that these these two the the sun parakeet and the red siskin occur in those in those southern uh, savanna regions, and so the best time to visit those savannas is after the rain. So the rains go May, June, July, maybe even the, into August, but then they'll start to dry out, and then the but the savanna is still a little wet and still very green into October, uh, September, October, and so so we organize it at that time because it's the time when you can expect the savannas to be dry but still green and lush and beautiful. Okay and what's the current official bird count of Guyana? <laughs> well, that, <laughs> I knew you were gonna like this one. <laughs> that partly that partly depends upon uh, what you on this on the scientific uh, it is a scientific question of what what do you call a species, but it's, there's also some subjectivity to that question. So, um, so for pe people on the call that are familiar with birds, I, I should first say that the the number of birds is in Guyana now known is about 830 or 840 currently recognized species. Um, so that's the short answer. Uh, but depending on how you treat different populations of birds, whether you call them separate species or subspecies or whatever, 
you could you could increase that number or decrease that number. Uh, and that's the while there's a lot of science that goes into understanding the evolutionary diversity in those populations, it ends up still being a, a subjective question of do I want to treat these two divergent populations? Do I want to treat them as one species with two subspecies or multiple populations, or should we call these all separate species? And there's a there's a wide range of um, of scientific uh, of opinion on that on that question. Again, it's it's subjective opinion, but it's a very important question because those lists of species are what wildlife managers and ecologists and conservationists use to try to uh, assess the biological diversity of a region and to set conservation priorities. So this next question kind of goes along with that. And just a final note here, this will be the last question that we ask before we wrap things up today. We just want to thank you for sticking around with us. And um, on that note, this final question is, what do you believe should be the responsibility of ecotourism businesses in the country and or what do you think needs to be improved upon? Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> that's a leading question. So um, I, what I would say is that, um, that those responsibilities and, uh, and obligations and opportunities uh, are, are evolving and have evolved. So for example, I, you know, they, I mean, I was, a, I was a young birder in college uh, when ecotourism really got started in the 1970s, you know? Um, and it, it started because field guides, like the one that I mentioned earlier, David's Field Guide to the Birds of Venezuela, to, uh, to tropical areas first started appearing. The birds of Panama, birds of Venezuela, uh, started at birds of Mexico. And that allowed north temperate birders in the United States, Canada, and in Western Europe, where there were a lot of bird watchers and birding was an active uh, pastime and enjoyable thing that people did a lot of. Uh, that allowed them access to tropical birds, uh, but they, you know, because often, you know, the people didn't speak the local language or they didn't know the birds well, they didn't know where to go. It presented an opportunity to develop these ecotourism companies like Field Guides Incorporated, uh, like Wings, like uh, Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, Rock Jumper, and others. Uh, and so these are, were all companies that were started by uh, folks in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, South Africa, in the case of Rock Jumper, I believe they're from South Africa. Um, and uh, so it was started by folks, you know, uh, that were interested in international travel and, and trying to do this kind of thing. But over these past 30, 40 years, you know, a great deal of expertise has developed in the local communities. So in Guyana, you have people like Ron Alacock, Leon Moore, uh, Wally Prince, and others who started out in those those guys, some of those guys started out and other people in this photograph that you see here with me, these guys are people that I've traveled with, Justin, um, Justin DeFreitas, uh, you know, As Asaf Wilson and uh, Ashley, uh, Ashley, oh, Ashley, what's your last name? Not Cunningham, I'm thinking of another Ashley right now. At any rate, the, those guys have traveled with me for the past 20 years, but now they're all making a living on ecotourism in Guyana. Uh, so, so it's 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 developed opportunities locally in Guyana, in Panama, in Mexico, and just every every tropical country. David Escanio, he is Venezuelan by birth. He got his start, and he's an international, a very well known international tour guide. But he got his start with Victor Manuel Nature Tours coming to Venezuela. So now there's a lot of local people have developed uh, their skills and they've developed uh, bird uh, lodges, you know, eco lodges where people can go to visit. Uh, and, and the international companies are recognizing that, you know, they really depend now on the local expertise, both in logistics and in knowing the birds and knowing the habitats and knowing the rivers and knowing the people. So, so it's, a, it's a collaboration now. And I think uh, that's the direction it needs to keep going. You know, the international uh, at the international level, you can help do the marketing and bring people and match people with the right opportunities, but the local people uh, can really maximize 
the experience in country. That's a great answer. Thank you for that, Michael. Thank you for taking the time to do this presentation for us today. Again, it uh, meant a lot to have that collaboration with the Smithsonian Institution and the Guyana Tourism Authority. So thank you on behalf of everyone. And of course, thank you everybody for attending our webinar today as well. As I mentioned, it will be recorded and I will send that recording out to everybody within the next day or two. So don't worry if you had to miss any part of this great presentation, it will be coming to you soon. So. On that note, uh, once again, Michael, thank you so much for your time and for sharing all of this with us. I know we've had a, a lot of people type through what a great presentation it was, so thank you again. My, my pleasure, Jenna, glad to be with you. All right, have a wonderful Tuesday, everybody, and I will make sure to let you know next time we have another Guyana webinar coming your way, so take care until then. Thanks, everyone.